right, let's study God's Word together. If you would, please uh, get your Bibles out and you can begin to turn uh, to 2 Corinthians, excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Uh, we'll be reading in just a moment out of 1 Corinthians. And it's always good if you have your scripture with you, and that way you can read along. If not, you'll be able to follow along on the screen overhead. We don't want you uh, to not hear what God's Word is saying to us. This is the second installment of a series I started the end of uh, last year that I entitled The Responsibility of Christian Liberty. The Responsibility of Christian Liberty. And I'm teaching uh, these next weeks about the true nature of freedom uh, because we are living in an age in fact we're living in a church age that thinks they're free but in reality they're not and I started last week uh, talking about uh, what true liberty and false liberty is it was entitled uh, living in an anything goes era and I'm not going to review at all today I mentioned to you I'm going to be building every week but you can hit uh, our website and you can go to legacy media through YouTube and you can catch up on absolutely everything and you can be right where you need to be but we've been talking about true liberty and I encourage you to uh, get that under your belt as we continue this morning uh, this week as I was thinking about the message uh, I happened to uh, pick up and reread uh, a treatise by Martin Luther on Christian Liberty who besides Pastor Baird would look through the internet and find a treatise written by Martin Luther. I mean, I understand I'm just sort of an odd bird in this regard. But most of you, I suspect, have heard the name of Luther in some form or fashion. Uh, he was a 16th century monk. He was called by God to be a reformer, uh, primarily of the church of his era. Uh, the church in the 16th century had lost its way. And uh, as I began to think about that in that time period, I began to realize that his time was not all that unlike our time. In fact, the, the Dark Ages, historians tell us, existed between the years of 500 A.D. and 1500 A.D. So for a thousand years of history, uh, they are labeled the Dark Ages. And the reason they're called the Dark Ages is because in that period of time there was no advance. No technological advances, no intellectual advances, uh, they called it the Dark Ages because it was just a really, really dark time. In fact, the same modes of transportation that took place in A.D. 500 were still the same modes of transportation in A.D. 1500. Nothing changed. Now, you may say to yourself, whoop de doo big deal. Imagine right now uh, that our nation is only, what, a little over, what, 230 some odd years old? And think about all the changes that have taken place since 1776 to 2014. Think about that. Think about just in your lifetime how many changes technologically have taken place. Well, imagine a thousand-year period where absolutely nothing changes. Well, it was called the Dark Ages for those very reasons. Culture was stagnant. It was spiraling in destructive patterns. There was no life. There was no creativity. It was decadent, and it was evil at a number of levels. It was a time when men did what was right in their own eyes without much thought of God. The church had lost its influence, it had lost its voice, it had lost its prophetic mandate to the world. And as I was reading through all of this again, it reminded me of how, of how our time has similarities because our culture is morally unraveling. The ministry and the people of God are at times no less different than the world in which they live. We've watched high profile ministers and pastors collapse morally and fall. I read of a sad report recently of a pastor who had mysteriously died until the autopsy was done and then they found out that there was cocaine and heroin in his body. At the time of his death, it was revealed that he frequented strip clubs. It's no wonder he was in divorce proceedings. And he was able to do all of those things while pastoring a church. Now, I understand when I tell those stories, it... Uh, could slosh over on any one of us and I always hate that whenever one falls it seems like all of us get slosh but the truth of the matter is is that someone needs to just say out loud that the degree of licentiousness that our current culture and church live in may be somewhat different than the 16th century the truth of the matter is there is a virus right now in the American church that we just have to acknowledge 
because it is rooted in our lack of understanding as to what true liberty really is. And if you doubt me at this point, all you have to do is join Facebook and look at some of your Christian friends' Facebook page. And it will leave you scratching your head as to whether they know the same God you know or not. The pictures, the clothes, the places, the jokes, the parties. I mean, even Facebook itself makes jokes about it. And, and, and there's this virus that's running through, and it's sort of like the elephant in the room that nobody wants to talk about. Well, I'll talk about it. All right? So, in the 16th century, God raises up this reformer by the name of Martin Luther. And he writes this treatise on Christian liberty because he saw then what some of us see today, and that is there is a gap in the church's understanding of liberty. What does freedom for the Christian really mean? It's a point of needful reformation. Does it mean that you can do anything you want to do, anytime you want to do it, without any worry concerning judgment or condemnation or repercussion? I mean, you, you know it nowadays. Whenever somebody is brought into accountability, what's the mantra of our era? You're judging me. Just when we're bringing simple accountability. So Luther started this little book with what has now become a famous quote. And I put it on the screen overhead. He said this, A Christian man is perfectly free, Lord of all, subject to none. And then he said, A Christian man is the perfectly dutiful servant of all, subject to all. Now, I just want to leave that up there for a moment. And uh, you may or may not want to write that down, but I want to let that sink in for just a moment. Because as you read those two sentences, they seem contradictory. It looks like he's saying two things that cannot exist at the same time. It's actually a paradoxical thing. You know, a paradox is when, is when something is said that seems impossible or seems contradictory, but it's actually true. It's like when Jesus said that if you'll lose your life, you'll save it. Or if you'll be a servant, you'll become the greatest. Or if you go to the end of the line, he'll bring you to the front of the line. Are you following me? It seems paradoxical. And indeed, those statements are paradoxical. And they exist at the self-same time in every true Christian believer. Now, I'm going to unpack this in two messages so I can properly give attention to both sides of the equation. So I'm encouraging you to just keep your church attendance faithful and going here in the next few weeks. But I'm going to talk this morning on what I've entitled, you'll love this title, the message is, You Can't Make Me. You Can't Make Me. Now let's read a little scripture here, just so we make the sermon legal, how about that? 1 Corinthians 9.19, I'm going to read you just one verse. It's Paul's writing, in fact we'll be back here next time. 1 Corinthians 9.19, he says, For though I am free from all men... I have made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. Just that one verse. Talking about you can't make me. Now I want to give you the short version of what Paul was saying right here in this one verse. He said this. He said, no one can tell me what to do. I'm free from all men. Nobody can tell me what to do. But then he goes on to say, however, I have a larger concern than simply what I may can or cannot do. Now, for those of you that have been parents, and for the rest of you who may not have children yet, or maybe it's been years since you've had them, you'll still identify with what I'm about ready to share with you. You see this principle at work in your kids. My oldest, Clayton, was our strong-willed child. Now, we love Clayton. Clayton. We're grateful he's still alive, actually, after the years having him in our household. But, but Clayton was the first one, and with the first one at times, you're experimenting as a parent. You're trying to learn your parenting skills. But God decided he was going to give us the strongest-willed one first. And, of course, as a parent, you want to protect your child. You want to help them along the way. And so we were with Clayton. Everything we did for Clayton growing up was for the express purpose of him having the best life possible. Isn't really that what parenting is all about? 
You're wanting to be sure you help your kids in some form or fashion to have the, the best life possible. We wanted to help him avoid any heartache, to avoid any hurt. And you know what? I, I think that's really most parents' desire. I mean, most of us, I don't think we sit up at night. At least I didn't. I didn't sit up late at night after my kids had gone to bed and, and got in the old lazy boy chair and kicked back and got my notepad out. And I began to write down all the ways, you know, that I could mess my children's life up and implement them in the days ahead. I don't think anybody does. Anybody here really done that? You said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mess my kids up, so let me figure out how I can do it strategically. Nobody does that. We don't want them to be messed up. We really want the best for them. We might not always do it right, but that's normally the intention. But something happens to all of us along the way of parenting. As you're raising up your children and you're guiding them along, there comes a moment when you hear this phrase, you can't make me. Now you just fill in the blank. You can't make me wear that. You can't make me go there. You go to restaurants. You can't make me act right in a restaurant. You can't make me. You can't make me take a nap. I mean, all of you in some, maybe not exactly like that, but, but you know they're looking at you and, and they're staring you down and they're saying, you can't make me. Sometimes you'll hear it between siblings. You know, the older to the younger and the younger looks at the older and says, you're not my boss. We get older, we say things like, who died and made you God? <laughs> you can't tell me what to do. Now, you need to understand that those words are the words of carnal independence. Now, kids, they don't have a restraint button. So, so whatever's in a child, they usually just blurt it out and say it. However, we need to understand that this is hardwired into all of us. It's a part of the sin nature. It's a part of the package. Adults say it. We're just more refined at it. Christians say it a lot too. It's, it's really the mantra of the seeker church that's so popular today. And because we know we can't make anyone do anything. And so we navigate everyone's independence. We never challenge it. We just, we just navigate it and massage it. Now as a parent, we establish rules. We establish boundaries, punishments in order to help our kids make good decisions. The reason these things are implemented is because we want them to mature appropriately and correctly. If we don't do this, then what happens is their maturity is not carefully established. And if it's not established right, then what happens as they grow up is that they begin to be easily influenced in wrong directions. They lack experience, and so because of their lack of experience, it causes them to make poor decisions, and then they develop poor decision-making skills. They turn out selfish. They become slaves to that selfishness, and what happens is they not only hurt themselves, but then they hurt everyone around them. And so in most of our homes, I would hope, we establish rules, or we establish what we'll just call the law. You come to Pastor Baird's house, and my children will tell you there was a law that existed in my house. And my law may have been different than others' law, but it was my house. This was the rule. This was the law. And if the law was broken, then we have as parents the capacity to lovingly inflict the correction. Now, I want you to hear this, parents. If you don't lovingly administer the correction a day will come when society unlovingly will implement the correction i can tell you right now as a pastor i have to implement correction on occasion and i can tell you right now most people can't take it because they grew up in homes that they were never corrected in and so the first time another brings correction to them they're so blown away by it because no one's ever corrected them because they've lived under that mantra you can't make me you can't make me. But understand what that correction was for or should have been for. As parents, we correct in order that one day these kids might be blessed. And if we don't do it, then a police officer is going to do it. If we don't do it, a judge is going to do it. If we don't do it, a boss is going to do it. Somebody's going to do it because nobody gets through life without a little correction. So the question is, will you help them succeed or will you foster the you-can't-make-me syndrome? 
Now, this same principle, believe it or not, is used in civilized society. Do you understand here in America, from the very beginning, we've touted the phrase that we are free. We are free. Come to America and be free. Now, you understand that despite the fact we are free, there's still boundaries. There's still laws which keep us from crashing our lives and creating some anarchy where we hurt other people. You know, one of the critiques that I'm often amused by is when people tell me, because they don't want to believe, you know, one of the first cardinal doctrines of Christianity is the doctrine of depravity, which means all men were born uh, e uh, evil with a bent towards sin. We were all born with a bent towards sin. People hate that doctrine. It's a biblical doctrine. They, you want to hear them say, no, 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 no. Man is born basically good. Don't you know that human beings are basically good? Well, if human beings are basically good, then why do we pass laws? We don't need any laws then, do we? Well, no, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, we probably need laws. Well, why do we need laws? Well, think about it. We aren't that good. We aren't that good. There has to be boundaries. There has to be, there has to be law. Because man is not good. In fact, by our nature, all of us are, you can't make me. In fact, I guarantee you, if they took the speed limit signs down from the interstate, we'd have the Audubon. We'd, we'd have NASCAR. We can't even obey the sign that says what the number is on the sign. You can't make me. But we've erroneously defined that as, as being free both in our culture as well as our churches. You can't make me. I'm free. Well, you know what? God, with his children, did the same thing as parents do with their children. He created law initially in order to give us boundaries. And I want to read to you the passage because a lot of people don't get the law, where the law comes in and where grace comes in, and they don't get these concepts. So let me, let me just read what Paul said to the Galatians because they were struggling with the place of law. And he said these words in Galatians 3, 19 through 24. Let's read it on the screen overhead. He says, what purpose then does the law serve? He's going to answer the question. He says, it was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Now, a mediator does not mediate for one only, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? Now, I'm going to stop there because isn't that a question people are asking today? You can't put me under the law because God, the Lord set me free to do, to, to achieve this, to be blessed, to be healed, to be rich. Listen, Paul says, is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. But the scripture has confined all under sin that the promises by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept, listen now, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Now, I'm going to unpack that for you here in just a moment. What was God's purpose in the old covenant for the law? I'm going to give you four quick things. This is why he originally instituted the law. Number one, it was a revelation of what disappointed and grieved God. The law is necessary because it made practical what it is that grieves the heart of God. The reason he, and we'll just use the Ten Commandments. There were other laws besides the Ten Commandments, but we'll just use that as our as our illustration point. He understood that if you are going to be a serial adulterer, do you understand that, that it doesn't, how do I want to say this? God isn't phased by people's sin. God isn't phased by what we do or don't do. I mean, he's God. But do you understand that the reason God instituted laws was not because somehow God was easily offendable or that he didn't, you know, he wasn't mature and he couldn't handle things. Or God instituted most of the law in order that we might understand that these are boundaries in order for our success and our joy and our happiness. Amen. I know there are people right now who feel like they can sin with impunity and they'll say they are free. But the key is they may feel joy for a moment, but you got to wait until the end of that road. See, sin provides pleasure for a season. 
But then it goes on to say that the way of the transgressor is hard and that the wages of sin is what? Death. Death. So, you know, the enemy's, the enemy's sly. He can make you feel like, as a lawbreaker, you're free and you're getting away with things. The thing you don't realize is that there will come a day when payday happens. And so the law was given to us to reveal what disappointed and grieved God. Secondly, it provided boundaries to get to the promise. It's the same reason you give law or rules to your children. They need boundaries in order to get to their destiny. There is a road map to kingdom success. And some of the road is codified within those precepts, within the commands and the laws of God. The Lord, you know, is wanting you to be in his promise as a whole person. And just as parents, we help our kids. So the Lord instituted law in order to help us get there as well. Number three, he said it guarded our future. The reason we give boundaries to our kids and, and I'll just tell you, there are certain boundaries that we give to our children. We, we've given to them from their youngest days to their teenage years. You know, we're going to know certain things. They're not going to be in certain situations with the opposite sex. We're going to do these things. Why do you do it? It's because we're guarding their future. We want them to have the most and best opportunities. More than that, we want them to have the will of God. We don't want them to be disqualified. From the will of God. So our laws aren't just to be hard. Our laws are to help them. Understand, even with pastor, if I bring order to things or correction to things, it's not to hammer you. I'm trying to get to a land, to destiny, to the purposes of God. But our DNA rises up and it says, you can't make me. Just like your children. And what happens is, is if children become incorrigible, then you, then you watch them sadly take this route. Now, I understand every child has to make their own decision along the way too. But we all know why we instituted these boundaries. We were guarding their future. And then number four, though, I believe the law, as it mentioned in Galatians, teaches us that we needed something greater than rules. Now, none of us, let me just say this again, none of us, can live up to the perfection that God puts out there. That's why Romans 3.23 said that we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. So no one, no one can live perfectly. However, being unable to be perfect does not absolve us from the desire or the pursuit of righteousness and holiness. You know, you can't codify everything. You know, there are Christians who say that if it's not clearly stated in the scripture, then, well, it must be legal to do. Well, be careful because nowhere in the scripture does it say thou shalt not smoke crack. But I would say that might limit your future should you choose to go down that path. Are you following me? So be careful. Be careful that you don't become, as we mentioned last week, legalists. It, you know, there are things that God couldn't say, and he understood that. That's what Paul got revelation on in the book of Galatians. He said something more has to happen to us. You just can't throw laws out there because truth of the matter is, and, and, and some of you know this, you can throw laws out there, but the minute we're out from under any restraint, what happens is we lose our mind. As most of you know, I'm grieved by the inability of the 21st century church to arise to its calling of holiness and integrity. We all know self-identified Christians who are without character and simple morality in their walk with the Lord. We're living in a lawless, standardless, unteachable, antinomian era that has produced a deception that is across our nation. Jesus said that would be the atmosphere of the end times. We divorce at will. We abort our, our children without thought of what it will happen. We fornicate like barnyard animals. We live together unmarried with impunity. We get drunk, blasted, buzzed, jazzed consistently. We carouse, we're addicted to pornography, we are in debt, we gossip, we hate, we backbite. I could give you the list at the same rate as those who are in the world. And all the while, we tout our freedom. I mean, if I were the world, I would ask, what are, exactly are you free from? 
You're free from what? Now, I said clearly last Sunday that the law cannot redeem you. It can't redeem you. That's what Paul said in Galatians. He said, if the law could redeem you, there'd be no nece- it wouldn't be necessary to send the seed as the promise to redeem you. So the law can't redeem you, but we've not understood the place it has. You see, Jesus was not a lawbreaker. The Bible says that he came to fulfill the law and the prophets. And because of that misunderstanding, it has caused the church to be impotent and seen as irrelevant as we are as dysfunctional as the world. Our bondages and our hypocrisies are seen in the pulpit to the pew. So in response to that, what I've tried to do through the years is that is that I've wanted to raise a church that tried its best. Now, hear me. I understand. Ain't none of us perfect. If you think you're perfect, just thinking it made you imperfect. But we've tried our best to be a standard bearer to a culture in order to tell them that this is the possibility, life as a possibility in Jesus Christ. I'm not here to reflect the culture. My God, it's falling apart. And to whatever extent we've been successful in that, it's not happened, believe me, without the misunderstanding of many and the exhaustion of this pastor. To be perfectly blunt, it's difficult to make people do anything you can't make people be obedient you can't make people accept a conviction you can't make people live according to a standard you can't make anybody really in america do much of anything in fact the only way you'll ever see those things happen isn't by making people do it it's when their heart gets in it It's hard to motivate a generation to maintain some semblance of Christian standard, even to be a minimum disciple in an era that sees simple obedience as legalism. Isn't that interesting? You just, you put, some of you are on Facebook. Go ahead and put, just put a statement from the scripture out there by way of one of God's commands and just wait for the, you're judging me and you're a legalist. Just wait. You can't call a generation to obedience to the word without being called a legalist. Remember, we were having a conversation recently, and I, I started thinking, you know, we, we've done, and, and, and we're going to be doing some more in, in the near future, uh, encounter weekends. It used to amaze me how people, after they had received Jesus Christ, would be so stubborn about getting free. You know, it was amazing in encounter weekend how you would literally have to go home with them practically the last week before encounter to make sure they would get to the encounter weekend it always amazed me how you had to make sure their alarm was set so they'd wake up in time it always amazed me it just it amazed me in fact what began to dawn on me was I wanted you to be free more than you wanted to be free in fact for some people you're counting on me to keep you saved I mean, everybody, don't they? Everybody wants their fire insurance policy. Everyone wants to make sure that when they die, they get to go to heaven. But nobody really wants true freedom. Because what we say is the minute it's preached or it's taught or it's shared or however it comes to you, our motto is, who died and made you God? You're not my boss. You can't make me. And indeed, that is true. No man can make you do anything. I can't make you do something. A life group leader can't make you do something. Your best friend can't make you do something. Your spouse can't make you do something. Your good friend can't make you do something. Nobody can make you do anything. That's what Paul said. He said, I'm free from all men. No man can make you do whatever you don't want to do. In fact, I'll just share something with you. I believe this to be true. God can't make you do everything. That's why we quench. The scripture says you can quench the Holy Spirit. You can resist the Holy Spirit. I mean, it's amazing to me. He doesn't make people get saved, does he? He doesn't make you get filled with the Spirit, does he? I mean, if he could make people do that, I figured he'd have the world by now. He can't make you pray. Don't you think if he could make people pray, he'd just make them pray? But he doesn't make you do that, does he? 
He calls us to it. He woos us to it. He wants us to be drawn to it. So it should come as no surprise that if even God isn't going to make anything happen, then it shouldn't surprise us when other people can't make it happen. I'll just give you an illustration. I, I started to get this epiphany at the first, you know, when we first came over here and made our transitions. You know, it used to be when we'd have early morning prayer time. And, and you know, Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. And so I just kind of, you know, you know me, just pastor, he just lives in la-la land. You know, I just kind of assumed since Jesus said his house would be a house of prayer, that maybe the church would pray. Isn't that a crazy thought? I just read it in the Bible and I just assumed he meant it. It's crazy, I know. Just, just bear with me. I, I'm just a nut. And, and so what we did for years, and you know this is what we do. We'd call people in. We'd drive them in. We'd, you know, especially we'd ask even leaders, you know, could you be here on time? And we'd ask them to be here on time. And it's just amazing how we can be on time for anything and everything, but sometimes going to prayer just isn't on our list. I always wondered, I, I've wondered with our kids and I've wondered in our own life, how in the world do your children, for an example, get to school on time when all I've seen maybe is 30 minutes late? They've got to be in trouble a lot. How does your boss handle that? And yet, with the God of the universe, we have trouble. So here's what I, I decided. I just decided this. Hey, I can't make anybody do anything. I can't make them. I can't do anything. This is, I'm heading on. And if you want to come, come join me. If you don't, I love you. God love you. But I'm going on with God. Because you can't make people do what they don't want to do. You see, we got to understand after a while, what happens is we reveal the heart. See, if I could get saved for you, I'd do it. I've tried that. If I could get free for you, I would do it. But I can't. I can't, I can't make you do anything. No one can make you do anything you don't want to do. So the question arises, and it, I put it on the screen, what keeps people from being unrestrained if you can't make them do anything? Now, this was always my greatest concern. And it's, it's the same concern parents have for their children because here's, here was our greatest fear. It was my greatest fear, and it, it may not have come to you yet, but it's going to be one of your greatest concerns, is that as your kids get older, and especially when they get in those upper teens and they're about ready to leave the house, and you're beginning to understand that there's going to be a day that they're not going to be under your roof, your greatest concern is the minute they get out from underneath this roof, what are they going to do? I mean, that concerns, I mean, it concerned me. Because you, you know kids leave the parents' house and they go to school and, and they get this giant brain cramp. They go to college and all of a sudden everything you taught them under that roof goes right out the window when they go to college. Once the boundaries are removed, all of a sudden they experience what they think is freedom and they just go crazy. You know, the same is for a Christian. When you force people... When you force people to function under legalism, you may get the right response for a little while, but it's not in their heart. The minute the rule is gone, they go nuts. The children of Israel is a great example. You know, when Moses, Moses was able to solicit their deliverance from Egypt, and he begins, and this is really interesting because he, he brings some order to this five million person chaos that he's moving across the desert. He gets to Sinai. He leaves them for just a few moments up in Mount Sinai, and the first thing they do is they melt all the gold down, and they build a golden calf, and they go crazy. <laughs> kind of makes me wonder what happens during pastor's sabbatical. I mean, it's just... <laughs> I, I, sorry, I couldn't resist. So the question is, how do you restrain people? How's, how's restraint come? Well, I'll say it again. The only thing that can restrain people and ever has restrained people is their heart. What's in the heart? Give a person their freedom and watch what they do. I will tell you it will unveil the heart. So the question is that if the heart is the only thing that can bring a sense of circumscription to our lives, if the heart is the only thing that can bring a sense of order to our life then the question is if we're born with this sinful heart bent toward evil which i told you was one of the primary doctrines of christianity that we've all been born into sin or evil then what do you do with a heart that's naturally hardwired to say you can't make me what do you do with that pastor 
I tell you what happens. It's what God told Ezekiel when he said, I will take out of you that heart of stone. And I will put inside of you a heart of flesh. What he was saying there in this wonderful imagery was, I'm going to give you a new heart. I'm going to take that old thing out and I'm going to put this new thing in. And that is what we call conversion. Conversion. We're living in an era of decisions, but not conversions. People make decisions without having conversion. I read to you last week that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And then he goes on to say, and we all with unveiled face are beholding the glory of the Lord and being transformed by it, he says, from glory to glory. So this transformation or this conversion is a perpetual thing in the heart of a believer. You have to have a heart transplant for that to happen. All of us, me too, all of us are born with this heart that's screaming, you can't make me. Your children are born with that same heart. You can't make me. Me do what me want to do. You're not my boss. We're all born with that heart. How do you get rid of that heart? Well, you can direct it for a short while by implementing uh, the boundaries, but ultimately there has to come conversion. That's why I'm looking at some of you and I'm just kind of bouncing back and forth. I really had not intended on doing this, but that's why we've got to pray that a generation that has grown up in church gets converted. <laughs> because just because your kid goes to church doesn't make them a Christian. You've heard me say this any more than if you let them sleep in the garage, you'll make them a car. And so we got to cry out for a generation, starting with our own, that says, God, convert their heart, transform their heart. I can guide them and train them and direct them for a season, but there's going to come a day that I'm going to have to let them go and trust you. And at that moment, if their heart is not converted, they're in trouble. And that's kind of where, you know, for me, sort of as a pastor, I've come to as well. I understand that, that as much, I understand I'm the shepherd and I can, I can bring order and direction and guidance and maybe people even grant me a little bit more influence. But, but I, I get it that you can't make someone do what they really don't want to do. And so all you can do is train them up in the way they should go. And then cry out to God that their hearts would be converted. See, that's where America is. See, you can look at it statistically, and we're growing churches bigger than we've ever grown them. I mean, I was looking at the statistical numbers the other day about how large churches are getting and about how big things are getting and about how much is this and that and the other. And I'm telling you, I'm watching all of this as our, as our culture continues to spiral. Why is that? It's because we're parked in a garage, but we ain't a car. And we're parked in churches, but we're not converted. And there comes a moment that you're going to sense, I believe, out of your heart. And it's, and, it's, and it's not we're questioning anyone's salvation. In fact, how could I question it if it's the real thing? But the point I'm trying to make is this, that it's easier to walk the walk when you've got a new heart. It's easier to be obedient when you've got a new heart. I've often said this, man cannot put a yoke on you. You can say amen. No man can put a yoke on you, but Jesus will. The difference between man's yoke, which is hard, and Jesus' yoke is this. He said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And what he meant by that is this, that when he apprehends you and when he corrals you and when he yokes you for his purposes, he's going to ask things of you. And the reason it's easy and light is because you don't have the same heart you had before. You got a new heart that says, yes, Lord, whatever you want, I am yours. I'm yours. If anyone ever looks at you and says, that's just too hard, just smile at them. Listen, I, you know, not everyone lives like I live, and you don't have to live like I live, but my life's not hard. And the reason my life isn't that hard is because of a heart. I do what I do because in the heart, I desire to do it. So we've got to begin to pray that, that the body of Christ, so to speak, has a heart transplant. The heart that was bent on its own way has to be replaced by a heart that wants God's way. 
So the question becomes, what must happen to the church to break out of this lawless antinomian, you can't make me age, what's got to happen? Well, God sends revival and he begins to convert the hearts again. You ever notice how revival always starts in the church? Isn't that an odd place for it to start? I used to think that. I don't think that anymore. I think that's probably exactly where it needs to start. That our hearts are converted. And when they're converted, things start to happen. Jesus told us, Jesus told us that, there, that in the last days, that the church would be full of tares as well as wheat. Things that would look like it might be actually uh, right, but internally it's not right. And that's why, that's why I'm just sharing this with you is because right now, all of us in this room, and I want to believe and I will believe that 99.9% .9 of everybody in this room, you would say, yep, I'm converted. I know I'm converted and that's great. And we'll all sing hallelujah. And I have no way of verifying that or not. All I will say is this, that if there's not a heart that desires everything that God has. And I'm, I'm not talking just the promises. I'm talking even the boundaries that will get you there. See, I've come to understand that God asks me things, and, and, and he isn't asking it just so he can beat the fire out of me. He's doing things in order to get me to a promise. And I trust him in that regard. Do you trust him in that regard? The only, interesting, the only difference between the 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 newborn believer and the one that's walked for maybe decades. Well, there may be numbers of differences, but let me, let me tell you, I go back. Let me, let me take two steps back. The similarity between somebody that's 30, 40 years old in the Lord and maybe somebody who's just a few weeks old in the Lord, there's one commonality. Their lives won't look exactly the same. The circumspection that has come to their life won't be exactly the same. The new person who's just recently come to know the Lord, the Lord's going to be working on them. Things will be falling off. There's grace to walk that out. And so they're not going to have all the understanding or teaching or discipline or instruction or experience. And so there's grace. Believe me, there is grace. Nobody's expecting somebody one week old in the Lord to look like somebody who's 30 years old in the Lord. But this is the same. The same thing exists between both. And it's this. There is a passion. There is a passion, there is a fervency to want all that God has. My life may look different than your life. Your life may look different than my life. Maybe you got a better handle on some areas than I do. Maybe I got a better handle than you do. I don't know. We can't measure each other up by each other. Then you will get into legalism. But what we can measure is this. Are you passionate for everything that God has? That's, that's the thing. Uh, that's the same in all of us. You know, Trace isn't here this morning. She's uh, over in kids' church. But she's told the story before how uh, she grew up uh, really in the church that we both were a part of in legalism and strict, strict boundaries. I told you last week, anybody that comes up to me and hollers legalism, I, I, I come with me, I'll show you legalism. <laughs> My wife tells the story of how she grew up in a home and it's no fault of her folks that that was the church they were in and it was the church we all grew up in and we just sort of assimilated certain things into our system and and she will tell the story how she grew up in a home that had very very strict boundaries a very rigid rule system and in the church we grew up in it included everything from the clothes that you were allowed to wear there were clothes rules there were attendance rules uh, at certain venues around town um, she was expected growing up to adhere to the convictions of the household and and a lot of them were just probably a lot stronger certainly than we have used in our house uh, because truthfully uh, uh, they were just some of them were crazy and she explains though that as she grew up in this household it was at some level easy because she could always say in fact a lot of times growing up in high school her friends would ask her to places or do certain things, and her response would be, well, I can't do that because my dad won't let me. My dad won't let me. And so she could kind of skirt it off and, and make sure uh, that he took the hit. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't really me. Dad won't make me. You know, dad, dad, dad isn't going to let me. And, uh, and so it kept her, by her own admission, from developing uh, her own convictions and her own standards. There was a day that she will 
tell you about that she arrived that she was asking her dad about somewhere I think she was going or something like that and her dad looked at her and actually it was a it was a very smart and savvy thing for him to do he told her that from this point forward she was no longer under the expectation to adhere to his standard to the house's standard or to any other standard she could no longer say that her dad was making her do this she was on her own and she said at that moment she said it almost scared her because suddenly she couldn't just opt out by saying well you know dad won't let me or mom won't let me but all of a sudden she had to decide what was in her heart she had to suddenly get mature and develop her own walk with God and develop her own convictions in other words she had to find her own spirituality she had to find her own maturity and in some ways and she will tell you that it became harder because it's easy to be able to say, yeah, yeah, I can't do that because, you know, I, you know, I go to that church or, you know, I hang out with that pastor or I just, you know, I, and you're skirting it off. And that's why I said maturity is hard because there comes a day that you have to grow up and out of your heart, you have to make the decision. What is it that God has asked me to do? And will I live by that? Because that's where this transformation begins to take place. Are, are you following me? And we're living in an era where the heart and hearts have not been changed. They've not been changed. And, and again, I, I realize someone could watch this on YouTube and, you know, they can hear what I might have to say and, and they'll think I'm judging in this matter. When I tell you that that sometimes you, when you look at folk and you scratch your head and you say, I don't, get, I don't get how they can do this. Listen, I understand there's liberties, and we're going to talk about the place of liberty uh, next time when we're together and the place of meat-eating. Most people do not understand the meat-eating passages that Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians. We'll get to that, and uh, we're going to tell a lot more stories with that as well. But for most people, you have to understand that when you're seeing their life, you're seeing their heart. When you see their life, you see their priorities. That's not judging you. That's just making observation. Nobody's ju judging means when we drop the gavel and we say this is the outcome. Nobody's dropping the gavel. I'm just simply saying that, that your life betrays your heart. And, and the honest part is this, that you be able to look at your life and to be able to say, this, this is how my life looks, and somehow or another, if my life is looking a certain way, then maybe my heart isn't really where I thought it was. Because here's the day we're getting into. God, God is saying, and I believe he's giving us over. I believe he's giving this nation over. And the moment, the moment he gives this nation over will be the moment we will see. And we're seeing it right now. We're seeing what's in people's hearts. And that, that freedom, when it comes, it will betray the heart. And so, as we get down to the end of this word, the, the question is simply this. What's in your heart? I don't know what's in your heart. Your neighbor doesn't know what's in your heart. Truthfully, your spouse doesn't know what's in your heart. It's only you and God that really knows what's in your heart. And so what we're going to do this morning is we're going to take a simple heart check. Is that okay in the house of God to take a heart check? I would think it'd be a good thing to measure it, to be honest. To say, Lord, is, 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 is there a heart in here that needs converted? Maybe there's aspects. I, I think aspects of it may yet be converted. Maybe some of it is dead and it can be brought alive again. But we need, this is the era that we need our hearts alive and fervent and passionate towards God again. Music